Our God and our Father, we are so grateful to you this morning for gathering us here together today in this place. This place, Lord, where you have put your presence, where your spirit rests and rules and leads and guides. Father, we live in a world that is seeking after many things. But we here gathered here this morning, Father, only seek you. We seek you, the true and living God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who we are earnestly seeking and who know, we know and believe will come back to gather us unto himself again. But while we wait, Father, we gather to worship, we gather to pray, we gather to praise and glorify your name. For truly you alone are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and beside you there is no other God for, through whom men should be saved. So in the name of Jesus Christ today, we ask, Father, as we gather, that your eyes and your spirit and your presence would be with us. Flow through us heart to heart and breast to breast, Father. Let us know the presence of your glory in this assembly. Visit with us. Be pleased with what we offer you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All grace to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out onto us who belong to his dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he encourages our freedom. He has showed us his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us the mysterious plan of God in Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Amen. Amen. Please join us with our first hymn, which is number 138, as our own sister Chris Allen leads us in worship. Amen. <laughs>
Good Christian Men Rejoice, page 151. yourself culture that celebrates the individual but faith is not something that we can do on our own we need companions on the journey we need others to support us 
and strengthen us and encourage us. We put our journey in the hands of many people around us, and although it is a risk, we are better for it. We learn to trust that someone has our back as we make this journey of faith and love. Luke reminds us that when the angel came to Mary, she responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything said about me come true. She put her trust in God. God trusted in Mary, and God trusted in Joseph. In turn, we trust in God to be faithful to his promise and to, assist, and to sustain us as we continue through our journey of faith and love. We light the candles of hope, peace, joy, and love as our circle is complete. because you sent your one and only Son to save us. And it is because of our knowledge of this great love that we dare to approach you with all our worries and all our cares as we pray today for Abby, for guidance and to enlighten her heart that what is being done for her is done out of love. And to <coughs> clear to heal her, and for Greg and Jean, who recovered from COVID, and for Mary Ellen, continue to strengthen her, Lord, strengthen Gordon, encourage her, encourage her and enlighten her doctors, and for Leigh, for strength, encourage her, Lord, and be with her, and for Kathy and Tim, Abby, Emmy and Ethan. Guide them, Lord. Open their hearts. And for Amanda and Jimmy, encourage them, Lord, in the righteous ways and guide them and strengthen their love. And for Tom, enlighten his heart, Lord, and let him know that you love him and that he is very loved by so many. And encourage those, Lord, and be with them, those left behind in Afghanistan. Let them know they are not alone. And for the Petapine grandkids, Lord, encourage them. Give them guidance. Give them your love. And comfort, Lord, for Pops Roger's family. May pleasant memories 
encourage them in this great loss. And we pray, Lord, for the Gonzalez family today, and for Diane, and for Mikey, and for Mark Allen. Show them your love, Lord, be with them. Christmas greetings to everyone, and comfort to everyone who has lost a loved one at this time of year. It's a particularly tough time to lose them and to remember them. For all the empty chairs that are at these tables, Lord, we pray. And for those lost in the service of our country, we pray, Lord, for their families. For the Haddons and the Bentons, and for S and family. Healing for Carol, encourage to strengthen her and help with her recovery. And for Jim and Michael, we pray for healing, Lord. And for Ernie, touch him, Lord, touch his body, and heal all the broken parts. And for Ray and Pam, Elaine and Carol, we pray, Lord, that you will take them by the hand and show them your strength. And for John and Dana, we pray for guidance, Lord, guide their steps along the way. And healing for Janice and Susan. And for those who were in a terrible accident this morning on Route 95, Lord, we pray that they are all right and there is no serious injury. And for Megan Arnold, we pray for her recovery from pneumonia. And healing, Lord, for Greg Lestowski. Touch his body, Lord. Heal him. All the families of all the veterans, Lord, uphold them. Show them your strength. And for Chelsea, Lord, touch her in her mind and body. And for Alan, who is grieving today. And for Lynn and Sandra, Lord, we pray for your healing touch. And for Kathy and Zeb Maycumber, Heal them, O oh Lord. And for David, encourage him and strengthen him. And for Jerry and Donna, Linda, Jim, George, and AJ, uphold them, Lord, in all of their endeavors and in their healing. And we pray, Lord, for Barbara, who is still recovering today. And we pray for Gail. Reward his hard work, Lord, Increase his bounty with your love. And guidance, Lord, for Cole, who is young and needs to have his steps guided along the right path. And healing, O oh Lord, for Greg, who is recovering also. For these and for all the people, we pray to the Lord. Join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. John 15, 
verse 12, and John 3, 16. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what she conceived is in, in her is in the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are get to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through this prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then Joseph woke up. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. John 15, verse 12. My command is this, love each other, as I have loved you. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 Chapel family this morning, and for all of you watching us on social media, good morning to you. The title of the sermon today is How Deep Is Your Love? So here we are, 
on the fourth Sunday of Advent, deep in December, and the Christmas season is in full swing. The big day is almost here, and there's still shopping to be done, gifts to wrap, stockings to stuff, and baking and cooking to be accomplished. The atmosphere is one of the anticipation, and for many of us, the anxiety is running pretty high. How to get it all done in time for Christmas Day. When I was a child, Christmas was a busy time of the year, but at the same time, it was the most special time of the year in our, in our house. Excuse me. My dad loved Christmas and planned for it all year long, even opening a special bank account to cover the cost of Christmas. Every year, close to Christmas, mom and dad got all dressed up and went out to talk to Santa about buying gifts for the family. Actually, they were going to the bank and Christmas shopping afterward. And it was one of the few times that I was not allowed to go, to go out with them, so I was left in the care of one of my sisters. I didn't really mind so much because after all, I knew that my dad, who was very persuasive, would ask Santa to bring that wonderful toy horse or doll that I had seen in the Sears catalog. My dad was always as excited as we kids were about the coming of Christmas. And poor mom, being the thrifty one, never looked happy going out the door to talk to Santa. Her concern was the meal, cleaning the house, and what desserts she would be making for all the relatives coming for dinner. The atmosphere in our house at Christmas was full of anticipation, joy, magic, and most of all, love. In the midst of all this hustle and bustle of getting ready for Christmas, let's take a minute to reflect on why we do all the things that we do at this time of the year. What drives us to go hunting everywhere for that special gift for that special person? What drives us to cook and cook and clean the house and go out of our way to do nice things for others. Have we all gone crazy? Or is it the Christmas spirit of love? We've been working our way around the various candles on the Advent wreath. And you may have noticed that the first four candles, or maybe you haven't, correspond to the four fruits of the spirit listed in Galatians chapter five. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience. The four candles on the Advent wreath stand for hope, peace, joy, and love. Hope and patience relate to each other, so that works. So as we work our way around the wreath each week, we are working our way backward through the first four fruits of the Spirit. Love comes first in the fruit of the Spirit because it is the most important fruit of the Spirit and encompasses all the rest. Love is the last of the four candles because it is also the most important of all the other candles. And that is because in Advent, we are working our way toward the most important aspect of Christmas which is God's love for us in Christ. Christmas is all about love. Think of Joseph's love for Mary. You might say, well, of course he loved her. He was engaged to marry her, wasn't he? But in those days, there were other reasons to marry. Many marriages were arranged by parents and viewed as social or economic advantage rather than being on based on love or romance. So how do we know that Joseph really loved Mary? We know because of his reaction when he found out that Mary was pregnant during their engagement 
before they had been together as husband and wife. As far as Joseph knew, Mary had been unfaithful to him with another man. He might have been rightfully furious and had every right to be angry and hurt. Now Joseph had several options open to him in dealing with this difficult situation. He could go ahead and marry her anyway, knowing that the child she carried was not his. But Joseph, being a man was who, who was committed to following God's com commands, he knew this would go against God's ways. No matter how much he loved Mary, his relationship with God had to come first. He could have tried had her tried for adultery, but he knew that at the least, Mary would have been publicly disgraced, or worse, she would have been sentenced to death by stoning. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we read, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, <coughs> was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he decided to divorce her quietly. So Joseph did not choose to marry her in defiance of God's commands or expose her to public disgrace or have her tried and possibly stoned to death. He chose a third option of divorcing her, knowing that people would still talk, but she would not go through the humiliation of a trial or suffer a horrible death. He chose the way that would bring the least amount of harm to Mary. Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 tells us that love always protects. And Joseph chose to protect Mary. He chose the way of love. God approved of Joseph's choice and sent an angel to appear to him in a dream. The angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you ought to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. His love for Mary is the first example of love at Christmas time. The second example of love at Christmas time is the love Mary had for Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, we read, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. The birth of Christ is, of course, the center of the Christmas story. Mary gave birth to her son and gently wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. There's a natural bond and love between every mother and each child she bears. The child grows within her, being nourished by her own body. She has felt every kick and every turn that baby has made. She has wondered, what will the child look like? What kind of person will this child grow up to be? She has suffered the pain of childbirth, which is all but forgotten the first time she holds that baby in her arms. Mary's love for Jesus is indicated in other scripture passages, like Luke chapter 2, verse 19, that tells us, Mary treasured up all these things 
and pondered them in her heart. Now the word treasure translates to preserve or keep in mind or keep thinking about. And the word pondered means to bring together or think deeply or reflect on something. So as we read Luke chapter 2 verse 19, we can see that Mary wanted to remember every detail again and again. She went over them in her mind. She loved Jesus so much, she did not want to forget one thing about that magical night in Bethlehem. And no doubt, she turned it over in her mind again and again, trying to understand what it all meant and what the future held for her son. When Joseph and Mary presented Jesus to Simeon at the temple, you remember Simeon. He lived in Jerusalem at the time when Jesus was born and was known to be a righteous and devout man, according to Luke chapter 25. God promised Simeon that he would not die without seeing the Messiah with his own eyes. God's spirit moved Simeon to enter the temple just as Mary and Joseph were bringing Jesus into the temple to present him to the Lord. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and prophesied over the child. What he said is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 29 to 32. Sovereign Lord, let now your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. He told Mary there would be hard days ahead for her and her child. In Luke chapter 2, verses 33 to 35, we read Simeon's words to Mary. The child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Mary suffered greatly as she watched her son die on the cross, but her love for him never wavered. Mary's love is a central part of the Christmas story, but there is a third aspect of love at the heart of the Christmas story. That third aspect is God's love for us sinners, and this is really the heart of the Christmas story. John chapter 3, verse 16, expresses this love, saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Can you imagine a love so great? God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to live with us and suffer all the weakness of being human while living a perfect and blameless life. He sent him as a perfect sacrifice to die in our place. It is only by God's grace, his undeserved mercy, that we can have eternal life with him in heaven. Our job is to have faith to believe that Christ died for us and ask him to forgive our sins. The greatest gift ever given at Christmas was the gift of God's own son. If you ever doubt that God loves you, you read the Christmas story again and think about Jesus coming into the world as a helpless baby. Think about the man he grew to be, preaching the good news of God's kingdom, teaching people, healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now look at him, dying on the cross for your sins to bring you to God. Look at him risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now coming back for you to take you home with him forever. Nothing can separate you from God's love, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, 
nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I often wonder if Charles Dickens was thinking of this Bible verse when he created the three ghosts of Christmas that appeared to Ebenezer Scrooge in his novel, which I might mention is one of my very favorite stories. The ghost of Christmas present, the ghost of Christmas past, and of Christmas yet to be, seemed to show Scrooge that no matter what happened, what was happening, or what would happen, could keep him from redemption and love if he changed his ways, the way of the child born in Bethlehem. The answer for Scrooge, of course, was to open his heart to love, just as the answer for us is to open our hearts to love. The Christmas story is about love. And I cannot end my sermon without looking at one more aspect of love. And that is our love for each other. In John chapter four, verses 10 to 11, John says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. God's love always comes first, but then our love should follow. This seems to be the hardest of God's commands for people to, for people to follow. The world is hard today, and many people have grown cold callous and tough. It's not easy to love some people, but I'm telling you today, love them anyway. Why is it that at Christmas time, it is easier to love? I guess at Christmas time, the world's hard edges are softened and there's an atmosphere of giving, forgiving, goodwill and love. I think Dickens said it well in A Christmas Carol. The quote I'm thinking of was said by Scrooge's nephew, Fred, who responded to his uncle's bar humbug, Christmas is a humbug, by saying, but I'm sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave. It's true, isn't it? People are nicer at Christmas time, kinder, more loving. John chapter 15, verse 12 shows Jesus' words. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Our love for others should not be thought of as an obligation <coughs> as Christians, but rather as an extension of our love for God. <coughs> if God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die for you, how can you not love others in return? And if God loved others so much that he sent his only son to die for them, well, how can we not love them as well? Christmas is about love and a reminder of not only God's deep love for you, but also a reminder of how much you should love others. Is there someone you should help this Christmas? Is there someone you should reach out to? Is there someone you should forgive or ask for forgiveness from? What about after Christmas? It's always the right time to love others and treat them as you would like you or your family to be treated. What was it that Scrooge said? I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. Imagine the positive impact your love would have on the world if you extended it to every day of the year. 
If you open your closed heart and spread love, God's love and kindness into a hurting world, everything we do creates ripples that extend out from us, affecting other people. Let your ripples spread God's goodness and love to all people. Smile and do not respond to rudeness or unkindness by giving it back to those expressing it. Love always, because you do not know everyone's story or the pain they have suffered. The Christmas story shows us many examples of love. The most awe-inspiring is God's love for us in the greatest Christmas gift of all, his only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's how much he loves us. That's how deep his love is. So how deep is your love? It should be our goal as Christians to love as Christ loves. The measure of our maturity is our love for God and our love for others. Christmas is the greatest love story ever told. Open your hearts. Prepare your hearts for Christmas. Prepare, prepare your hearts for Christ coming again. Love one another now and throughout the year. Amen, and God bless us, everyone. Amen. 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 people cut you off in traffic and run into you with their shopping cart. 
Do not let it ruin your spirit. Be of good cheer and love one another always. Can you join me in our final hymn, Majesty? <laughs> Thank you.